Clinically, what is the precise measure that tells us we're dealing with hypoxemic respiratory failure? It's all about inadequate oxygenation in the arterial blood. And there's a specific number for that? Yes. The partial pressure of oxygen, the PaO2, has to be less than 60 millimeters of mercury. So less than 60. That numeric threshold is the non-negotiable definition. That 60 millimeters of mercury number is vital. But what makes this type 1 failure distinct from, say, type 2? What's the core physiological problem here? The core problem is a severely impaired transfer of oxygen. Between the alveoli and the bloodstream. Exactly. And here's the key part. This happens while carbon dioxide levels are either normal or, in many cases, actually low. So it's a failure of oxygen loading. It's not a failure to get rid of CO2. Precisely. That distinction is what guides your whole treatment strategy. Yeah. Unlike type 2, where high CO2 is the issue, here it's all about that gas exchange barrier. So we have to understand why that exchange is failing. You do. You have to know the mechanism to pick the right intervention. Which brings us directly to the five causes. This is really where strategy begins. Okay, of the five recognized causes, what's the one we're going to see most often in an acute setting? The vast majority of cases, I mean, maybe 70%, are caused by ventilation perfusion mismatch, VQ mismatch. VQ mismatch. So that's the most common reason for inefficient gas exchange. By far. So how does that present? I mean, what's actually happening when that VQ ratio gets thrown off? Well, VQ mismatch just means the ratio of air, which is ventilation, to blood flow, which is perfusion. Is abnormal. It's abnormal in the lung units. So think of pneumonia, where alveoli are filled with gunk but still getting blood flow. That's a low VQ ratio. Okay. The blood passes by but doesn't get fully oxygenated. And the opposite? The opposite is a pulmonary embolism blocking blood flow. You get plenty of air but no blood to pick it up. That's a high VQ ratio. Wasted ventilation. Both scenarios tank your overall oxygenation. Okay, so that sounds like a slowdown but the path is still there. Let's talk about the mechanism that's more like a complete roadblock, the one that's hard to fix with just oxygen. Ah, you're talking about shunt. Shunt. Yes, a shunt is when blood flows from the right side of the heart to the left side without ever seeing an open ventilated alveolus. It bypasses oxygenation completely. And what kind of conditions cause that? Give us some examples. The classic ones are severe atelectasis, where a part of the lung collapses, or uh, severe pulmonary edema, like an ARDS, even some intracardiac shunts can do it. And the clinical sign for us. The big sign is that you turn up the inspired oxygen and the PAO2 barely budges. So if the patient stays hypoxemic, no matter how much oxygen you give. You are almost certainly dealing with a true shunt. And that means you need more than just oxygen. You need mechanical intervention. Let's shift to the third cause. Diffusion impairment. How does that fit in? Diffusion impairment is different. It's a structural problem. The membrane between the alveoli and the capillaries gets thick or damaged. Like in pulmonary fibrosis. Exactly. It physically slows down how fast oxygen molecules can move into the blood. Is this a big factor when the patient is just resting? Less so at rest, actually. At rest, there's usually enough time for the oxygen to make it across, even through a thickened membrane. But not during exertion. Right. During exercise or stress, blood flows faster, mm. and there isn't enough time for that slow transfer to happen. That's when you see significant hypoxemia. Okay, now for the fourth cause, hypoventilation. You said earlier this one is different because of the carbon dioxide. It is. Hypoventilation is a global reduction in air exchange. So when ventilation drops, you don't just fail to bring in enough oxygen. You also fail to blow off enough carbon dioxide. You got it. It's usually a neurologic or musculoskeletal problem, not a primary lung issue. So a blood gas analysis will tell you right away. And finally, the fifth cause, the environmental one. That one's simple, low inspired oxygen. High altitude. High altitude is the perfect example. The lungs are working perfectly, but there's just not enough oxygen in the air to begin with. Okay, that's clear. Definition, PO2 less than 60. And five mechanisms, with VQ mismatch and shunt being the main players. That brings us to management. So once you've identified the failure, you have three immediate goals. And what are those three primary goals? First, restore adequate oxygenation. Second, support their respiratory function, meaning reduce the work of breathing. And third, start treating the underlying cause immediately. Let's stick with that first goal, oxygenation. What's our target saturation level? The goal is to get the oxygen saturation above 90%. Above 90 Consistently above 90% minimizes the risk of organ damage, but you also don't want to overdo it. Hyperoxia can be harmful too. Let's talk about high-flow nasal oxygen. It seems to have really changed the game in early support. What's its role? 
It's a fantastic tool. It delivers heated, humidified oxygen at very high flow rates, sometimes over 30 liters a minute. And the benefit of that high flow? A few things. It washes out dead space, provides a little bit of positive pressure, which helps keep airways open, and it's much more comfortable for the patient. It can definitely reduce the need to intubate later. But it's not always enough. When do we have to escalate to positive pressure ventilation? You escalate when you can't keep their saturation above that 90% target, or if their work of breathing is just too high. And the first step is usually non-invasive. Often, yes. Non-invasive ventilation, or NIV, uses positive pressure to help recruit more alveoli and takes a huge load off the patient's respiratory muscles. It can prevent fatigue. But at some point, NIV isn't enough either. When is invasive mechanical ventilation unavoidable? It becomes necessary for severe, life-threatening hypoxemia. Think of a patient with diffuse lung infiltrates from ARDS, or if they can't protect their airway, have too many secretions, or just so exhausted that they need full support to survive. And once we intubate, we're in the realm of advanced strategies. Let's talk about PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. This is our main weapon against shunt, right? How does it work? It's absolutely our primary tool for shunt. Keep applies continuous pressure at the end of every breath. To keep the alveoli from collapsing. Exactly. It stents them open. This increases the lung's functional residual capacity, which means more surface area for gas exchange. It directly counteracts the effect of shunt. But applying PEEP sounds like a delicate balance. What's the major caution here? Oh, it's a huge balancing act. While you're opening up collapsed lung units, if you set the PEEP too high, you can over distend the healthier parts of the lung. And that causes more damage. It causes barotrauma, ventilator-induced lung injury. It can also compress the vessels and drop the patient's blood pressure, so you have to titrate it very carefully. Beyond PEEP, what's the single most important strategy for lung protective ventilation, especially in ARDS? Low tidal volume ventilation, period. Low tidal volume. This means the volume of air in each mechanical breath has to be minimized. The standard is very specific. Six milliliters per kilogram of the patient's ideal body weight. Ideal, not actual weight. That's a key detail. Very key detail. And why is that specific six millimolar per kilogram number so important? Because it saves lives. It minimizes the physical stress and strain on the lung tissue. It's the strategy that has been shown, without a doubt, to reduce mortality in ARDS by preventing ventilator-induced lung injury. It's really the cornerstone of modern ventilation. So the ventilator is buying us time, Mm -hmm. But you said the third goal is treating the cause. Why is that so urgent? Because the ventilator isn't a cure. The underlying problem is what's driving the whole process. If you don't fix that, they'll never get off the ventilator. So antibiotics for pneumonia. Exactly. Or diuretics and fluid management for pulmonary edema, anticoagulation for a PE. Ventilation supports life while you reverse the pathology. Finally, what about everything else? What's essential for comprehensive supportive care? It's about treating the whole patient, not just the lungs. It means strict fluid management to avoid making edema worse. It means optimizing sedation so they're comfortable and in sync with the ventilator. And nutrition. And early nutritional support, yes. Plus, being relentless about preventing secondary complications like infections. It's truly multi-system medicine. This has been a very focused strategic review. So for you, the clinician, Remember the key numbers? Hypoxemic failure is a PO2 of less than 60 millimeters of mercury. And it's driven mostly by VQ mismatch and that very difficult mechanism, shunt. Management is about keeping that oxygen saturation above 90%, escalating therapy quickly, and using lung protective strategies.